Will you bow your head with me once again this morning? Holy God, as we worship you today, we sung, sung songs to you, we prayed to you, and now we come to hear a word from you. And so we ask now that you would humble us and prepare our hearts. We ask that you would help us to rely not on our own understanding, but on your teaching. We pray this in the name of the living God, and all God's people said, Amen. As I begin my sermon today, I want to let you know that I originally had an entirely different sermon that I was working on this week. It was a sermon that I was looking forward to preaching. In fact, I even thought it was a pretty good sermon. But I decided that it was not the right sermon for today. Instead, I decided I need to address what's been happening in our nation. I think we all know what's happened with all the protests around the country and even right here in our community. And I know that what's happening right now is a hot-button issue. It's extremely difficult to talk about with the climate that we're in right now, with passion so high and so many different opinions about what's happening. But it's happening all around us. You'd have to be living under a rock not to see it. And shepherding people through difficult and complicated times is part of my job as a pastor. I would be delinquent in my duties as a pastor if I chose to avoid things that are difficult to talk about. So I'm, I'm going to speak to the situation around us today. And I simply ask that you listen with open hearts and open minds. This is a complicated issue, a very complicated issue. And it's impossible to say all the things that need to be said. There are landmines all over the place when talking about something like this. So what I'm going to say is going to have a lot of caveats in it. So please listen humbly as I come to you humbly. I certainly don't have all the answers, but I'm doing my best to understand and talk about what our response as Christians should be. And that's very important because we should try to see everything through the lens of our faith at a time like this and a situation like this. So first of all, I will say that I am saddened to see our country so divided and, and torn apart by the riots and the violence that we've seen on the news. I am saddened to see that. I don't want to see that, and I don't believe God wants to see that. God doesn't want riots and violence to be our reality. God's heart breaks when God sees the human family that he created to live together and love one another being ripped apart by these things. We follow a Jesus who told us to be peacemakers. When Jesus came as God in the flesh, he said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Blessed are the who? The peacemakers. For those of us who are Christians, our witness should always be shaped by the Jesus who taught us to work for peace. And not just peace with our actions, but peace in our hearts especially in the way that we think about those who we disagree with. I hope you heard that. We are called to have peace, not just with our actions, but peace in our hearts, especially in the way we think about those we disagree with. We cannot hate those who we disagree with. Jesus told us to love our enemies. Martin Luther King Jr. said, Hate cannot drive out hate. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. If our hearts are simply filled with hatred or bitterness, that will not solve the problem. In the end, God wants peace, not violence. That is God's dream for our world. So I would encourage those who are protesting to protest peacefully. And I am thankful that many protests have been peaceful. Furthermore, I know that for a number of you, seeing protests or riots is not simply something that is happening far away in the abstract. But rather you have people in your family who are police officers and firefighters or other first responders and are in the thick of protests that happen. And you worry about them. You're scared for them and what happens every day when they go to work. You're worried about their lives and what they face when they go downtown. That's where your anxiety and stress comes from. And I have a relative who's a police officer in my family, so I hear your concern. And I, too, pray for them and for their safety every single day. 
And we should all pray for them. Not just right now, but always. They have a very difficult and dangerous job. We should thank them for their service. We should not take their service for granted. We should not take their sacrifice for granted. There's a mural here in Dayton, not too far from the church, that was painted in memory of a fallen officer named Steve Whalen. And it was defaced twice last week with some really, really nasty things that were spray painted on it. And that was wrong. That was wrong. We cannot stand for that. Think about how that must make his family and his loved ones feel. And officers, all officers, face that same risk that he faced every single day. And so I want to say that I am thankful for the work of our law enforcement and first responders. I am so thankful for them and what they do. We are blessed to have wonderful police in Dayton. They do a great job. They are, in fact, peace officers. They are to uphold the peace. We need them. I just think about last year with the tornadoes and the shooting in the Oregon District. How blessed we are to have had them in moments like that. Please don't forget that. According to Romans, God has put people in authority for our good. To help make sure our society functions. And of course we need to hold them accountable. But we need to honor them and respect them. They have jobs that are very, very difficult. And we need to appreciate that. So I want to say very clearly that I want to see peace in our cities and in our country. And I want to see law enforcement officers respected. However, however, if we are simply outraged by the riots and the violence that we see on TV, I believe that we are being very short-sighted. I believe we must take seriously the root problem that is the original issue that's led to all of this. And that is the continued problem of racial injustice that plagues our society. And as I talk about this, I ask you once again to listen with open hearts and open minds. Because it is so easy for us to get defensive and dismiss this, dismiss it. To cross our arms and put up blinders if it doesn't affect us. But it is high time that we take the time to really reflect on this in an honest way. If we can't take the time to have a real conversation, we're just going to keep having the same issues, the same violence, over and over and over again. You know, I have said that God is a God of peace, but God is also a God of justice. We can't truly have peace if there are people still treated unjustly in our society. If there is a claim that there are injustices and inequalities in our society based on race, we must take that seriously, even if we don't like the way some people respond to it. The Bible very clearly demands justice in the sight of oppression. In response to vain worship in Amos 5, God told ancient Israel, Take away from me the noise of your songs, for I will not hear the melody of your stringed instruments. But let justice roll down like water, and righteousness like a mighty stream. Any theology or ideology that minimizes or denies the importance of justice and fails to take seriously claims of injustice must be spoken against. Isaiah 117 says, learn to do right. Seek justice. That is a command given to us, God's people. And so we must admit the injustice of the past. One group of people in our country was literally enslaved because of their race and bought and sold as property, as you would buy and sell a car or a piece of furniture, treated as if their lives didn't matter. Not just one or two people, but a whole race of people. For 300 years. We can't just sweep 300 years of history under the rug or pretend that it has no implications for what's happening today. Now, I know what some might think. You might think, well, we had the civil rights movement 50 years ago to move past all that. We have all sorts of civil rights laws these days. Black people are protected from discrimination now. Or you might think, I don't hate anybody because of the color of their skin. I don't judge people any differently, whether they're, they're black or white. I don't really know anybody that does. And the truth is that we have made a tremendous, tremendous, tremendous amount of progress since the civil rights movement. And most people, most people are not outright racist now. 
And we do have laws that offer legal protection. We should celebrate that. Man, we should celebrate that. We, we can't forget that. That is a major step in the right direction. But the issue is the smaller ways that we may be biased implicitly without even realizing it because of the fact that we have grown up in a country in which one race was enslaved and openly discriminated against for most of our history. Again, we can't pretend that doesn't have any implications for today. Just like we look back to see how things that have happened uh, in the past here in our church or in our lives or our families affect us today and the present. It was not that long ago that black people had to sit at the back of the bus while others got to sit up front. It was not that long ago that black children could not go to the same schools or even play with white children simply because they were black. It was not that long ago that, that my town where I live had a sundown law where black people had to leave at sundown because they could not be trusted at night. It was not that long ago. And the legacy of what's happened in the past doesn't go away overnight. We can make laws, even like the black president. And that doesn't mean that there are not some issues that we still need to address. And this is not about white guilt. It's not about condemnation or shame. God is not a God of condemnation or shame in any area of our lives. This is about being honest with ourselves because God calls us to that. And there are little subtle things that we might not even notice that we may have learned. Like perhaps we're out walking. Maybe we live in a suburb and we see someone that looks different than us. And without even thinking about it, they catch your eye a little bit more than other people. Maybe without even thinking, we, we clench our purse or hold our phone a little bit tighter. Maybe we start to walk a little faster. Or we lock the car door. Or maybe there's the other side of town. You know the other side of town I'm talking about. And we make sure not to go over there. And rightfully so, perhaps. But subconsciously, we have a picture in our mind of, of what those people, those people over there, look like and talk like. Or maybe we see a black person, a black man wearing a hoodie or, or sagging pants, and we stereotype them in a certain way. We judge them. Most of us have some of these biases in us implicitly doesn't mean we're bad people. Most of us don't even realize it. It just means that we need to recognize it. I've asked a lot of black acquaintances, acquaintances I know, do you really have situations where you know people are looking suspiciously at you? Or where you feel treated differently? I mean, does that really happen today? And almost every single one of them has said, yeah, of course. Of course I've had plenty of experiences like that. It's part of the black experience. And surveys report that the overwhelming majority of black people, about 92%, feel that way. And we can say maybe some of these people are, are reading into things or, or projecting things. But can we really say that all of them, millions of people, are wrong about their experience because it's not ours? I don't think so. I think we need to honor it. Moreover, in my opinion, we would be naive to see videos of incidents like what happened to George Floyd in Minneapolis or Ahmed Arbery, the young black man in Georgia that was killed while jogging, and think that race did not affect the way they were treated. Of course, the fears and suspicions that are built on long-held stereotypes affect the way that they're treated. Just like when the lady in Central Park that was jogging says, there's a black man threatening me, a black man threatening me. There was some stereotype there that still affects our society. And that is not right. That is not something we can turn a blind eye toward. Perhaps it's why there have been studies that look at school punishment, where researchers have looked at children of different races who committed the same infractions and factored out everything else. And black children are more than three times as likely to be suspended as their white counterparts for the same offenses. More than three times as likely to be suspended for the same offenses. Moreover, there was a totally different study where researchers from several different universities created resumes and applied to 1,600 jobs around the United States. All of them different types of jobs and in all different industries. And in each job, they submitted two different resumes with the same qualifications, except one had a white-sounding name and the one a minority-sounding name. 
And those with a white sounding name were called back twice as often. Again, I think it's clear that these subtle biases, even if they're subconscious, still matter today. And beyond all these biases that affect individuals, I think we need to acknowledge the still deeper inequalities that our minority brothers and sisters face. You know, the majority of black children in the United States go to schools in high poverty areas. Depends on what study you look at for the exact figure, but it's well over half of black children. And because the schools are in high poverty areas, and our school funding model in our country is, is based largely on property taxes, those schools are not funded as well. On average, schools that are predominantly black receive about 1700 less for each student per year. About 1700 less per student. And that figure includes federal money that helps reduce funding gaps. And since these schools are not funded as well, with less money per student, that means they have to hire teachers that are cheaper, less qualified, and do not have many as many, as many resources to work with, from older textbooks to fewer arts programs. In other words, these students are literally getting a lower value education. This has been shown time and time again by all sorts of studies from across the spectrum. And in fact, I spent six months in an internship when I was getting a degree in education at an urban, predominantly black school. And it was absolutely eye-opening for me. In fact, it changed my life. Is it really all right that a certain segment of our population has to be raised in schools where they get an unequal education even today? What do we expect is going to happen when black and other minority students don't get the same education? Perhaps it's part of the reason why uh, while 8% of white families live in poverty, 21% of black families do. And why the average white family has 10 times, 10 times the average net worth of black families, 171,000 to 17,600. And because there's, a limited, uh, there's limited wealth and resources, and there is not the ability to afford good food and basic necessities. There is also limited uh, grocery stores and fresh produce in many black neighborhoods. Many black neighborhoods are food deserts, which have very little in terms of healthy food that people can eat, which makes people unhealthier and have higher rates of things like diabetes and obesity and disease, which makes it harder for kids to stay in school or parents to maintain a job, and then harder to pay medical bills. It's a vicious cycle. All these things are wrapped up together. We could just say it's the culture of their neighborhoods. It's because they have no personal responsibility. It's a breakdown of the family. And we could have some really legitimate things about that. The lack of black fathers in the home and the lack of family support at school are massive, massive problems that we should talk about. And they play a big role in this. We badly need more father figures and mentors in these communities. And a lot of this also clearly intersects with other issues related to class. But we can hold multiple things together at once. And we can look at study after study, and it seems pretty clear that there are some systematic issues and serious inequalities that black people still face in our society today. And we cannot just turn a blind eye towards those turn a blind, a blind eye towards those things if we're talking about God's call to address injustice. And you know, that's why people protest. There's a reason behind the protest. And that's why some people say that black lives matter. And I know that there's a struggle for many people when people hear that. I mean, the automatic response of so many people when we hear black lives matter is to say, well, all lives matter. And of course all lives matter. Of course all lives matter. Every single life matters. Your life matters deeply and measurably to God. But the reason that people say black lives matter is because for a long period of our history, black people were bought and sold, treated as if their lives didn't matter as much. For a long period of time, they were, so, they were told to sit on the back of the bus or told to go to some other water fountain, like their lives didn't matter as much. And many feel that for a long period of time, there have still been inequalities that make them feel left behind, like their lives don't matter as much. And that's why people feel the need to declare that black lives matter. 
And I know, again, that's hard for some of us. But just think about it. Just think about it and listen today to what folks are saying. I want to say lastly that when we talk about issues like this, we need to remember that we follow a Jesus who constantly was in relationship with the poor, the marginalized, the outcast. He saw things from the underside. And he got passionate about it. You'll remember he didn't just walk around with nothing to say. No, you'll remember he turned over the tables and the temple. He was passionate. When we see something unjust like George Floyd or the racial inequalities in our system, we need to be passionate and care about it as God's people. So again, I will say this. God does not want to see violence or riots or looting or anything like that. God does not want that. God does not want to see police and law enforcement attacked. God put them there for a reason. And we need to respect that. God wants to see peace in our world. And God also wants to see justice for all God's children. Today in the United Methodist Church, it's not only Trinity Sunday, but it's also Peace with Justice Sunday. We should want peace, but we should also be passionate about seeing justice with it. And in the end, I really strongly believe that this is not a liberal versus conservative issue. This is not a political issue. This is a moral issue. Even more than that, this is a gospel issue. I want to read part of a statement from the Wesleyan Covenant Association, which is a a conservative group of United Methodists. And this is part of a statement that they put out this week. They said this, Racism is sin. As Christians, we are called to relentlessly work for a society where African Americans no longer have to fear for their lives or be treated differently when encountered, or when they are simply going about the business of their daily lives. We must dedicate ourselves to building a church that bears witness to the dignity of all God's people, particularly those who have been marginalized, stereotyped, and treated with cruelty and violence based on the color of their skin. The church must summon every fiber fiber of its being to root out racism in its midst. Collectively and individually, we must examine our hearts, our minds, our institutions, and our practices, and with unwavering determination, stamp out racism. Our bishops, which lead our United Methodist Church, including our very own bishop in our our annual conference, also collectively released a similar statement this week. Again, this is a gospel issue. And I know that there are many sorts of discrimination. That there are all sorts of issues of of immorality and, and injustice happening in our culture. But this is something that we must look at seriously as the church. Again, it doesn't mean other things aren't important. They are. But this is definitely important because it's a part of our history. And so as we do this, we need to listen to each other. We need to learn from one another. We need to hear a variety of perspectives with a real willingness to hear what people are saying. We cannot ever grow if we're just screaming at one another and blaming one another. We need to listen to one another. And for those of us who are white, please, please seek out minority voices because it's so easy to miss the blind spots that we don't know we have. We don't know what it's like to live as a black person or any ethnic minority. We've never lived that even for a single day. But we need to have the conversations. And I am thankful that so many people are. I am proud that so many people are having these difficult conversations now. I talked to one African American pastor in the area the other day. He said, this has been a really hard week. He said, I've been crying. I haven't been able to focus. I've barely been able to go into the church to get anything done. It's hard, man. That's what he said. It's hard, man. But then he said this. He said, I have hope right now. I have hope because people and churches are starting to talk about this. This gives me hope. He said, I feel hope. And that's what this is about. It's about having hope for the future. In a second, we're going to sing a wonderful hymn, a hymn that we all know. I surrender all. And I pray that we would surrender all. Our complacency, our pride, our need to be right in whatever area we fall on these issues. In the end, we need God to help us with this. We need God's help. We're all flawed. We're all imperfect. So we need to ask for God's help as we talk with one another.
So let us pray. Oh God, this is a very difficult, complicated subject. But we pray that you would help us with it. That you would truly help us, Lord. Help us and hear our prayer today as we seek to understand and do your will. Yes, help us to understand and seek to do your will. Amen. Let us, let us now.